1968, Professor R. G. Harrison of Liverpool University led an expedition into Tut's tomb to X-ray the pharaoh's remains. Harrison followed in the wake of Douglas Derry, who autopsied the mummy 40 years before, in vain. Harrison believed advances in medicine would help pinpoint the cause of Tutankhamun's death. Harrison's own theory, tuberculosis. As he examined the body, the world saw for the first time the damage Derry inflicted. For his own autopsy, Harrison used gentler techniques. Piece by piece, he x-rayed the corpse. When Harrison x-rayed Tutankhamun's head, he found something even more dramatic. At the base of the skull, Harrison noticed an abnormal density, like a blood clot. This is within normal limits, but in fact it could have been caused by a hemorrhage under the membranes overlying the brain in this region. And this could have been caused by a blow on the back of the head, and this, in turn, could have been responsible for death. Harrison's examination was the last allowed by the Egyptian authorities, and the first to suggest Tut's death was no accident. Twenty-five years on, Copies of Harrison's X-rays have been released to Cooper and King for their investigation. Well, here you go, Doctor. Vital evidence for the detectives. These are the X-rays on Tutankhamun that we uh, talked to you about and need some opinions on. All right. The X-rays give Cooper and King a rare chance for a second opinion. They've asked Dr. Todd Gray, chief medical examiner of Salt Lake City, to re-examine the X-rays. Gray is no stranger to homicide. Together, he and the detectives have worked on a lot of murders. Gray is puzzled by a loose chip of bone, clearly visible in the upper left side of the skull. During mummification, embalmers use a sharp instrument to remove the brains from the skull via the nose. Could they have chipped this bone loose during the embalming? You don't normally, in the embalming process, knock bone fragments out, even though they are going up through the ethmoid plate. And that raises the possibility that there may have been some pre-existing fractures in this area that led to this bone being more easily dislodged in whatever processes went through, for, de for example... But um, if the embalming day, didn't dislodge the bone fragment, what did? The blow to the back of the head noted by Harrison. How could uh, the impact from the back of the head impact that bone that's floating there? Good question. It's a phenomenon called the contra-coup phenomena. When the moving head comes backwards and strikes a fixed object, what happens is the brain actually first impacts the skull towards the front. What you see are black eyes and fractures of the very thin bones that sit over the top of the eyes. And if there were fractures there, and then subsequent manipulations were occurring, that piece of bone could quite easily be the remnant or artifact of what may have been pre-existing pathology. In other words, the bones could have been loosened during the embalming, but they were broken before. Your investigative work needs to focus on whatever other evidence you may have that can help prove that this was a non-natural death. As the detectives build the case for murder, they enlist another expert for a closer look at the victim. Dr. Robin Richards of the Department of Medical Physics, University College London, uses 3D computer imaging to recreate facial features from skull measurements. Using the data gathered by Cooper and King, Richards undertakes an unparalleled challenge. 
to recreate the real face of Tutankhamun. These forensic reconstruction techniques are used by a number of different people to reconstruct found skulls where there are identification problems, typically from the police. The skull that we are working from has been reconstructed from X-ray views of the individual. While Dr. Richards starts to map the pharaoh's skull, the detectives pursue their investigation. Their case enters a new chapter. It will involve innovative techniques pioneered by the FBI and frequently used by Cooper and King. What we will attempt to introduce uh, through our investigation is behavioral evidence. And that is, what's happening in the life of Tutankhamun? Uh, what are the circumstances? What's the situation, the environment, the political uh, realities, the religion, back, religious background, etc.? And uh, any historical facts that we have to look into it as well. Ancient Egypt was dominated by the principle of Mart, order. The regular flooding of the Nile, the rising and the setting of the sun, and the worship of many gods. For centuries before Tutankhamun's birth, the most important of these gods was Amun. Cooper and King have learnt that Amun's priests were the wealthiest and most influential people in the land. Their power grew so great, it rivaled the pharaohs. In 1353 BC, a pharaoh came to the throne determined to break the power of the priests. He was Akhenaten, father of Tutankhamun. Akhenaten is admired by some scholars as one of the first people ever to embrace the idea of one god. According to one of the detective's key witnesses, in his own time, Akhenaten was viewed far differently. To begin to understand Tutankhamun, we need to understand that he was the son of a powerful revolutionary leader, of a dictator. He was the son of a Joseph Stalin, of an Adolf Hitler. Akhenaten would turn the world upside down and replace Egypt's gods with one supreme being. Little did he dream he'd set in motion the murder of his own son. Today, the Egyptian city of Amarna is populated only by ghosts. When Tutankhamun was born, it was the dazzling new capital of Egypt. To the ruins of this once great city, detectives Cooper and King travel seeking proof of Tut's murder. Reconstructing Tutankhamun's formative years in Amarna is the next step in creating what the detectives call a victimology. Tutankhamun was raised in Amarna. During the course of a victimology study, we go back and look at everything that we can find out about the victim uh, prior to the event, uh, during the event, and after the event. Amarna was built as Egypt's new capital by Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. In 1348 BC, he led 50,000 people into the desert, leaving the old capital of Thebes far behind.
in a little over five years, they transformed a wasteland into an oasis. The boundary stones marking the limits of Akhenaten's city still remain, carved into the surrounding cliffs. These stela offer a clue to Akhenaten's extremism. Look at this boundary stela. It's incredible. As I understand the stela, that it is a sense of a reaffirmation of Akhenaten's belief and faith and devotion to one god rather than many. Tutankhamun was born into revolutionary turmoil. To understand how Tut's father's religious upheaval might have affected the young prince, the detectives turn to a man who has compiled psychological profiles of some of the world's worst dictators and terrorists. The world that Tutankhamun was born into would have been mind-boggling for any child. He was born into an, in an artificial city, a city which his father created to preserve the illusion of immortality as well as his own invulnerability. Under those circumstances, Tut was a boy in a bubble, a bubble of his father's creation. Isolated from the outside world, it's likely Tutankhamun knew nothing of the reign of terror that many scholars like Joanne Fletcher believe his father instigated. Akhenaten was a terrible politician who seriously mishandled um, just about everything in terms of running the country. Um, he wanted to completely obliterate all trace of um, the state god um, and in this way completely remove the power of the clergy that served the god. By rejecting the old gods, Akhenaten made a host of mortal enemies. Unwittingly, believe the detectives, he created the circumstances for his son's murder. Recent discoveries in Amarna suggest a link between the turbulent reign of Akhenaten and his son's suspicious death. To learn more, the detectives question the man who knows this area better than anyone, Amarna's chief inspector of antiquities. Emad El Hamid has recently interpreted a wall carving that offers dramatic new evidence in the quest for Tutankhamun's killer. For centuries, the mural was hidden deep in a tomb that belonged to Akhenaten's chief of police. For Cooper and King, it's one of the most significant discoveries yet in their investigation. We are, we are in Maho's tomb. Maho was the chief of police in the reign of Akhenaten. Uh, if I understand right, then the chief of police is sending his officers to try to arrest whoever attempts to kill Akhenaten. Yeah. And they capture... Mr. El Hamid believes the carvings show the would-be assassins being tortured. So in addition to the images that suggest that, we also have other historical documents reflecting the same story. Do we know how many attempts were made on Akhenaten's life? They tried to poison him. So maybe two. Maybe, maybe two or more. Mr. El Hamid reveals the culprits, the priests of Amun, guardians of the outlawed god. Over thousands of years, only three pharaohs are thought to have been assassinated. The revelation that priests conspired to 